RC, pick your mic up. Pick your mic back up, RC. But but this is about the line of scrimmage, okay? And I know we've had conversations about B.A. and Byron Leftwich and Tom Brady, how bad he is against the rush. But this is really, truly about this offensive line and being able to protect Tom Brady and also on the other on the other side being able to create pressure. If you look at the Rams here, look, this is what we lauded Tampa with. Confusion. Everybody looking. Eyes bad. Look at the rush. This is what we talked about being a definitive yes. advantage for this football team. Now flip it to the other side. Look what the Rams were able to do. We talk about these interceptions, but this type of stuff impacts how quarterbacks perform throughout the duration of a game. You won't think that that's on Tom Brady's mind as this game goes along. Look at what this is doing to him. So listen, we can talk about the skill positions and I'll let y'all do it, but I'm going to get back to my wheelhouse. Number one with a microphone, but I'm going to get back to my wheelhouse of the line of screen. Image. Football still boils down to can you block them or can you get off blocks? And one of the major things that's been happening in Tampa is that their front line has not had success in games that they've lost against really good yes. rushing defensive lines and really good teams that protect well and give their quarterback time to operate from the pocket. Marcus, you're setting me up to do one of my favorite things, which is agree with you, and then bring some numbers into it. Ever since Ali Marpet, the Bucks guard, went out with an injury, they have dropped precipitously in pass block win rate, which is ESPN's way of measuring offensive line play. Since week seven, they've ranked 20, or pardon me, since week nine, they've ranked, ranked 23rd. Okay, this is a line that was protecting Tom Brady extremely well during the beginning of the season. And it's very obvious at this point in the year, Tom Brady doesn't play well when he's under pressure. It's as simple as that. Now, the Chiefs struggled to get much of a pass rush going against a pretty good Raiders offensive line last week. So to me, that is the key to this game. It's the matchup to watch. It's all about that offensive line versus the Chiefs pass rush because whoever comes out on top is going to be who wins the game. I'm Mina Kimes. ESPN. <laughs> Sorry. I wasn't expecting Well, that. it's my turn to talk. And I'm the only one that got a real microphone. So that's that. And on the other side of it, somebody better get the microphone away from Bruce Arians. Because if he starts to talk again after the Kansas City and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers game, you know what he might be saying? He might be saying that the quarterback on the other side is better than the quarterback that I now have was ever or had ever been. Because... Patrick Mahomes is that good. And when we watched this team, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, get right the week after losses, it was the Carolina Panthers. And the other week, it was the Green yes. Bay Packers when the Tampa Bay uh, Buccaneers defense played extremely well. So we need to see Tom Brady come out and play yeah. well. We need to see him do well against a team that doesn't necessarily pressure the quarterback. But on the other side of it, that doesn't mean you're going to win. That doesn't mean that you can outplay Patrick Mahomes. It doesn't mean that you can stop the weapons of the Kansas City Chiefs. And at the end of this game, we may be looking at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers sitting there with five losses. Somewhere we probably thought they'd be around week 16 or 17 and saying to ourselves, does this team, can this team actually win the playoff game? And that's never a place we expected Tom Brady to be this year yeah. or this team, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You know, it is sort of shocking. And if there's one thing that we've learned on this show, it's that nobody is safe from being made fun of. <laughs> what I would like to say is that while I realize that we're making fun of Ryan, Only he's got me. hair on the top of his head. <laughs> Mina's got hair on the top of her head, and she's using a brush to mimic Marcus, a microphone. Don't. Marcus, what are you brushing with that? With that thing that you have? That's supposed to be your friend, <laughs> L Boogie. I have, I have a little hair. I have a little hair, and the good just Lord the sides. Say, what you do with a little shows me what you'll do with a lot. Give you so a lot. I try to take well care said. of my little that I have so he can give me some more hair at some point as this career. Marcus, your hair is great. And time for one more thing before we go. And for that, we're going to send it right to Marcus Spears once again because he's got a great story to tell you about. Uh. Listen, I want to send a shout out to Sarah Fuller. She's about to be the first female kicker at Vanderbilt University in the, at a Power 5 school. This is groundbreaking, legendary, historic. She will be out there with the Vanderbilt Ooh. Commodore. Shout out to my man, Derek Mason, for doing this and giving her a real shot at being the kicker for his football team. And based on every report, she's really, really good at it and a part of the soccer team as well at Vanderbilt. So shout out to Sarah Fuller for breaking down barriers and also Vanderbilt for this opportunity being presented.
Uh, November 27th is always an extremely tough day in my household. Uh, Sean Taylor was one of my closest friends. I believe if it wasn't for him, I never get to be a starter in this league because he was so amazing, so great that they just needed a dude that could just stand next to him. Um, 13 years ago, I sat on my steps crying and I told my son Jordan what happened to his uncle Sean. Uh, fast forward to this week, Jordan gets his first tattoo and it says S dot forever because that's what we call Sean. And so for us, this is a very important day. This is the day we like to remember him. This is the day I want everybody around the football world, around the world to know how great of a person he was, but he was a better player, a better man, and a better father. Thank y'all. Well, you said it, Laura. It's huge because they get the bye right now. They are in pole position, and it does come down to these next few games when Drew Brees is out. Look, yesterday I had pumpkin pie. On Sunday... I had to have some humble pie, and so did everyone else on this show watching Taysom Hill because he was much better <laughs> than ex at pretty much anyone expected, honestly. He wasn't Steve Young, yeah, but he wasn't Steve Old either. He looked like an NFL quarterback. The difference this week is Denver is a much better defense than Atlanta, and they also have the benefit of knowing what's coming. If it's anything like last week's game plan, it's going to be a lot of play action to Michael Thomas. Now, Denver, again, without being surprised like Atlanta was, they might be more likely to stop that. So my question is going to be, is Sean Payton going to adjust the game plan? Will they benefit from surprise again? Because this is a huge game for New Orleans. Yeah, what's your counterpunch? When someone hits you in the mouth, what's going to be your next step? What are you going to do? And that's what we have to see from Taysom Hill. It was a very easy game plan last week against the Atlanta Falcons. The Atlanta Falcons were in limbo. They had no idea how Taysom Hill would be used. Shoot, neither did I. Like, I wasn't ready for that. I had to eat that humble pie. Humble pie. I said myself, he looked extremely quarterbacky, quarterbacking <laughs> the New Orleans Saints. And so now, what's the step on defense to stop him? And when they do that, what does Sean Payton come up or devise in order to to help Taysom Hill continue to succeed. And I'm excited to see that this week against who is a very good uh, defensive mind in Vic Fangio. Yeah, you know, Marcus, coming into the season, a lot of people thought one of the reasons why the Saints would be a Super Bowl contender had to do with their defense. And then the defense didn't really look like we expected them to look, but things have gotten better of late. What's your thought on this Saints D and how that can even hate, help Taysom? Yes, L, I know we like talking about the young, muscular lad from Brigham Young and Taysom Hill, but the real, the real story here with the <laughs> He's New not Orleans young, Saints bro. is He's the 30. defense 30. over the past few weeks. He's young. <laughs> He's young, R.C. We old. We have to accept it. You and I are old now. He's young. He was born in the 90s, okay? Listen, this is the thing. This is the thing, though. Like, we look at the New Orleans Saints, and we understand that Sean Payton is a guru, and he can – matriculate and do things offensively and kind of cover up some of those weaknesses. This defense is becoming what Mina thought they would be because I got to shout out and give a credit um, about this secondary and then up front they're starting to get after the passer. Trey Hendricks is a part of the, he's league leading in sacks. We see Cam Jordan starting to come on because people can't focus on him. This, uh, this defensive line is starting to control games. Y'all, they, look, for as much as we killed the Tampa Bay Buccaneers about that game, the Bucs only scored three points. That had a lot to do with that New Orleans Saints defense. And now you get into the point of the season where you look at the Saints offensively and say, okay, when they get Drew back, they can pretty much match everybody offensively. Now if this defense keeps continuing to build and roll, we might be talking about the Saints being back in that Super Bowl conversation with the young, muscular lad from Brigham Young. Hey, listen, the only people who are old on this show that is boy anybody. That taking nobody no Super Bowl. Wait, what? What, Ryan? Not him. I'm he just saying he's going to be a part of it, RC. My bad. Well, I mean. Young, muscular.